Genesis chapter 1. Last week we were, last week we actually took a break from the right division study and we talked about the love of Christ and things on, on that line, but I'm going to get back into this right division thing and try to wrap it up this morning and move on to something new next week. But what we looked at two weeks ago was the, 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 the Bible being about a, a book about time and how, how the Time is a process uh, by which God is working all things after the counsel of his own will to bring about his own purpose for heaven and earth that he's purposed in the Lord Jesus Christ. God has an eternal purpose. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul, Paul says, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So God purposed an eternal purpose in Christ for heaven and earth before the world began. And in the beginning, he set that purpose in motion. Uh, Paul tells us in Colossians 1.16 that by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, both visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So when God in the beginning created the heaven and the earth, he created it all by his son and for his son. And time is the process by which God is working out that eternal purpose which he purposed in Jesus Christ in heaven and earth. And that's what we looked at last week. And it's important for you to understand that. Hold your place here and, and come to Ephesians chapter 5. So we'll, part, we'll, we'll do it like this. Beginning and end. But we, that's time right there. But we know God is the Holy One that inhabits what? Eternity. That God has neither beginning of days nor end of years. So the question is, is what is this beginning and end here? What is this little period here from Genesis 1-1 out to Revelation chapter 21? What is that time about? What is it? We, we know it's a process. We looked at that. But what is this period of time between point A and point B? And what is God doing in this process of time? Right? And it's important for us to get it. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. That's where I told you how to go. Ephesians 5, 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. You know who Paul's writing to here? He's writing to save people. He's writing to Christians. Christians that have believed on Christ and have been justified unto eternal life. You know what he tells them to do? Wake up. Told them that in Romans 13 also, didn't he? Now it is high time to awake out of sleep. And he says, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming what? The time. For the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what? What the will of the Lord is. Right? Look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Now, you, you realize when he says understanding what the will of the Lord is, you know what the Bible says about that, don't you? The Bible said, who hath known the mind of the Lord? <laughs> Amen. Come on. Paul's telling you to understand something that the Bible says, no man hath known the mind of the Lord. But he wants us to understand what the will of the Lord is. You see, it's not... When, Paul, when the Bible says who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor or who is first given to him, what that means is, is that you cannot sit down here and figure it out just by sitting and meditating upon it. You don't have it in you to figure out what the will of the Lord is. The will of the Lord is a subject of revelation, not logic. It's not the subject of your imagination or sitting around and trying to figure it out in yourself. 
The will of the Lord is a subject of revelation. He has made known the mystery of his will. And Paul wants us to understand it. Look at Colossians 1.9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So you know what Paul wants for us? You know what Paul's prayer for us living here is? Is that we would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Why? That we might walk worthy of the Lord. You know, if you're not, li- if you're not using time according to what God is doing in time, you're walking in vanity. Nothing you do is going to amount to anything. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap what? Corruption. He that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap what? Life everlasting. Only what God is doing in time is going to amount to anything in eternity. This is his process. Now you get a portion of this time that God set in motion back here. And if you walk in ignorance of what the will of the Lord is and don't redeem that time, what you're doing in time is vanity. What did Paul tell you in Ephesians 4, 17? That henceforth, that means from this point on, that you no longer walk as other Gentiles walk. How do they walk? In the vanity of their mind having what? The understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have given themselves over to work all uncleanness with greediness. That's what the Gentiles are doing. Look at them out there. Tell me that's not what they're doing. They're past feeling. They've just given themselves over to just Greediness and uncleanness and lasciviousness. They have no point to their existence. They don't know why they're here. They're just going to acquire a bunch of junk until till they die. Amen, they don't know what they're doing here. But I understand God's process. I know what God is doing in time and what he's called me into. And the more you understand the will of the Lord, the more you're going to understand how to redeem that time for God's will and purpose. You're going to understand how to walk worthy. Right? And so God has made known the mystery of his will. And it involves, according to Ephesians, it involves what God is doing with all things in heaven and earth in the fullness of times. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And he's made known unto us the mystery of his will about gathering all things in heaven, all things in earth, in Christ, and then gathering to them together, heaven and earth, becoming one in the dispensation of the fullness of times. So when all time is over, there's going to be a marriage between heaven and earth. Heaven and earth is going to become one. Two will become one. That's what you're reading about in Revelation 21. That's a marriage taking place between heaven and earth through that new city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. That's what you're reading about. Amen? That's the mystery of God's will. This is a great mystery. But I speak what? Concerning what? Christ and the church. And so now, in the beginning, God created two realms, didn't he? The heaven and the earth. That was just a little rant about time. Now we're going to get into this right division stuff. God created the heaven and the earth. Right? Come to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Let me ask you this. Are these two places the same? (laughs) No. No. You know how I know? Dr. Ruckman said, you know how I know? They're spelled different. Right? But you got to understand these two realms being different, guys, because you were taught in school that the earth is in the heaven. 
And that is unbiblical science. I'm sorry. The heavens are above the earth. Now I'm so I hate. I mean, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. You're gonna to have to pick sides on this thing. You're gonna believe the Darwinian monkey men, or you're gonna believe that inspired book of the Creator. As far as heaven is above what? If you can search heaven for height, earth for depth. I mean, unless you, unless you believe Einstein and up ain't up and down ain't down anymore and everything's just relative. I still believe in absolute truths, Bill. When God says the sides of the north, you know what I, I think? I believe him. When he uses words like up and down, I think God knows how to use the words up and down. But what, what I want you to get is that these two places are different. Let me ask you if these two things are different. Is God in heaven different? Because God created heaven, didn't he? Well, then why does the average Christian going around think the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are the same thing? Can you explain that to me? I mean, if you're not going to take the words in your Bible literal, you're never going to learn, you're never going to understand what I'm about to show you this morning. Because the key to right division, first off, is to believe the very words that are penned on your page. And if you don't believe circumcision and uncircumcision has any meaning, or secret and spoken has any meaning, or Gentile and Israel has any meaning, then how are you going to deal with the passage that talks about the gospel of the circumcision, the gospel of the uncircumcision? Amen. How are you going to understand what God kept secret since the world began and what he spoke since the world began? You're going to have to start taking the words on the pages of the Bible literal and serious. Because God gave us, what did Proverbs say? The words of the Lord are pure words. They cannot be improved. God gave you the very words he wants you to have and they're pure. And so look at what he says here in Acts 3.19. Peter says, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Get it now. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. All right, so number one, I already understand a few things about that. Somebody there is being offered the blotting out of sins when Jesus comes. Right? Or am I making that up? Somebody's going to get their sins blotted out when the Lord returns. And that's prophetic. I can show you that in Zechariah. I can show it to you in Isaiah 59. But when the times of refreshing shall come from when? From who? The presence of the Lord. Guess, guess what has to happen before that times of refreshing comes? Lord has to come back. Well, guess what? He ain't here. Now look at what he tells them in verse 20. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Is that what he said? Well, where's Christ at right now? God didn't send him. You know what that tells me? The times of refreshing haven't come. And it also tells me Israel didn't repent. And it also tells me Israel didn't get their sins blotted out because the Lord ain't returned. There you go. But what does that have to do about the year 2022? If none of that happened, then what about the time you live in? Because look at what he says in verse 21. Whom the heaven must what? Isn't that where he's at right now? Whom the heaven must receive until what? Times of, so the times of restitution begin when? When the Lord comes back, right? Come on, y'all wake up, man. This is Bible doctrine. All right? Christ went back to heaven. He must stay there until the times of restitution of all things. Right? Right? So guess what? I know from this that we're not living in the times of restitution. You know how I know? 
Where's the Lord at right now? Is he in heaven or is he on the earth? All right. So the times of restitution haven't come yet, right? But when he returns back to the earth, this begins the times of restitution out here. Israel's sins are going to be blotted out when the times of refreshing come from his presence. And then the times of restitution will begin. What has that got to do with you? Because he's not here. What's he been doing for the last 2,000 years? Look at what Peter says. Look at what he says about these times of restitution. The times of restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since when? The world began, Genesis 1.1. These times of restitution out here that Peter's referring to when the Lord returns, these times of restitution have been spoken by the mouth of God's prophets since the world began. You got that? Look at Romans 16 now. Y'all know the passages. But you're going to know them a little better. Romans chapter 16. How many of y'all believe what Peter said? Amen. I believe what he said. You know what he don't talk about? He don't tell you anything about from the time Christ went back to heaven until he comes back. That's where you're living. Amen. You're living between the two advents. What are you doing? Waiting for him to come back to get your sins blotted out? Do you believe if you repent this morning that God's going to send him back? You see why it's so important to get that Bible straight? Because none of what Peter just said has anything to do with the time you live in. Amen. What is God doing between the two advents? That's a wonderful question. Because when Jesus went back according to prophecy, there was only seven years left before he come back. He's been gone 2,000 years. So what's God doing today? Do you think it's important for you to know what God's doing today? Amen. The only way you can walk worthy of him is to know what he's doing today. The only way you can redeem time is to know what God is doing today. And if you think God gave you that book and he's going to hold you guiltless for not studying it but wanting to play church your whole life, he's not going to. He gave you that book so that you could walk worthy of what he's doing. Amen. And not get in his way and add to the confusion and make a mess of the things that you touch. Yes, we got enough uneducated people trying to handle the word of God. I ain't going to call them uneducated. We got enough dishonest crooks handling the word of God today. We don't need any more. What about the space in between these two advents? Well, look at Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you. Guys, there's, that's, you know, when I read the Bible, man, I think about all the precious jewels in that book. Quietness, peace, joy. What else do you want out of life, man? Right? If you, can, if, you can, if you can go to bed at night, if you, if, you can, if you can die and know that you have a, a quiet spirit and peace and joy, who cares about the money at the end of the day, right? If you can die at rest and at peace with God, what more do you want out of this life? And I, read, I, I read this right here. Him that is of power to establish you. Can, do you understand what, what Paul's talking about here? The very power of God to give you stability? To be established by God's power? To be unmovable? Seven and a half billion people come against you. If you're established by God's power, they can't move you. They locked Paul up. You know what he said about it? He said, nevertheless, I am not ashamed. 
to be established by the very power of God. But notice the end of verse 26. Made known to all nations for the what? Obedience of faith. So what is God's power to establish you? The power for God to give you stability and to establish you is in what He made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. If you don't take what God made known and obey it by faith, then the power of God to establish you is going to be ineffectual in your life. You've got to take what God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith and, let, and by believing that, God's power to establish you becomes effectual. Amen. It's been working to me for 20 years, Bill. 20 years ago, I was a dumb little babe in Christ, man, just tossed to and fro. Didn't know up from down. Didn't know what preachers were lying, what preachers wasn't. And 20 years later, that book's been working in me for 20 years, and the power of God has established me and given me stability in what He's made known. Right? Paul talks about this in Ephesians. Till we all come in the unity of what? The faith. And the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more what? Children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Do y'all believe them men are real? Do y'all believe there's snakes withering around this world holding Bibles, lying in wait to get you messed up? I believe the Bible. I believe the majority of people. Tell me I'm lying. Look at the Christians of this world. Are they defined by stability or are they defined by being tossed to and fro? Amen, Bill. Why well, ain't they got no stability? They don't know what God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. They're being tossed to and fro by the cunning craftiness and slight of men out there lying in wait to deceive them. Most of the Bible they know they heard from some lying snake. I believe those men are real. I don't believe they're carrying Korans. and That's part of it. I'm telling you, there's plenty of corrupt people out there with the Bible. Lying in wait to deceive people. Tossing people to and fro. People running around today. They don't know if there's a pre-70th week rapture or not. They don't know the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. They don't know how a man gets his sins forgiven. They don't know the gospel. And it's a shame because God has given us His power to establish us by what He's made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. All right? Look, look at what Paul says next. What is God's power to establish you? It's according to my gospel. And, get it now, and the preaching of who? Jesus Christ. According to what? Kept secret since when? Now, if that's the beginning of time right there, and since the beginning, something had been kept secret, and something had been spoken, you going to tell me they're the same and there's no need to rightly divide it now? Amen. Amen. What's Peter talking about in Acts 3? He's talking about these times out here that have been spoken by the mouth of all of God's holy prophets since the world began. What's Paul talking about in Romans 16? He's talking about the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. And if you want to be established by the power of God, you're going to have to understand this. Because if you get them mixed up, guess what you're going to be? Just a little baby tossed to and fro. Amen. Man going to take Matthew 18, going to take some passage back in Ezekiel. Some man's going to take Hebrews, Revelation. He's going to get you so twisted up you don't know up from down anymore. 
Amen. They can't get nowhere with me. I'm stable, Bill. And what made me stable was the power of God. And I got the power of God through what he made known for the obedience of faith. Right? Notice this now. God, Paul talks about that which was kept secret since the world began. But what? Look what he says. The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Kept secret since the world began. But now is made manifest. Y'all believe that? How many of y'all believe that? Well, let me ask you this. If it was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, was that, does that mean Isaiah knew it? Did God say he hid it in the prophets? No, I'll tell you where Paul says it was hid. It was hid in God. Who created all things by Jesus Christ. Let me read you, let me read you this NIV in Romans 16. Tell me the devil ain't up to his, uh, up to his old usual tricks. Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past. Boy, that's so much easier to understand than since the beginning, ain't it? I mean, you got, a, you got the first book of your Bible says in the beginning. Kept secret since the world began. For long ages past. How long? See, it's not even defined. You have no starting point, no reference. Just long ages past. But now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings. How can it be made known through the prophetic writings if it had been hid and kept secret? Amen. Man, take that thing and boot it across the... Throw it, I mean, my goodness, man. You see what them people do? That is not a Bible, guys. That is something to toss children to and fro. Paul gives you a reference. Kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. And if it's now made manifest, and kept, if it's kept secret since the beginning until now, that means it wasn't revealed in the prophetic writings. Because here's what I want you to understand. We agree on this. Since this point right here in Genesis 1-1, there are things that God had spoken since the world began and things that he had kept secret since the world began. We can acknowledge that much, right? But I want you to understand the deepness of what Paul really just said. Because what's going to make you stable don't be one of these mid acts people who thinks it's okay to remain stupid about everything else in the Bible except what Paul wrote. Because look at Ephesians chapter 3. Then, and, then, and then you got these Acts 28ers, man. These Acts 28ers, they... Romans through Philemon were too much for them. So now they're like, ah, body of Christ didn't begin to Acts 28. And we're just going, we just go by Ephesians. And, you know, it, yeah, by the time these guys get, by the time some of these right dividers, listen, that's a difference in motive. My motive is to show myself approved unto God. I study that book from cover to cover. When your motive for right division, you can always tell them, not for you, not for you, not for you, not to you, not to you, not to you, not for you, not to you, not to you. That's not yours, that's not yours, that's not yours. By the time these guys get done rightly dividing, they got five verses in the Bible. Look at Ephesians 3.10. What is Paul making all men see? The fellowship of what? The mystery 
which hath been hid where? Who created what? All things. Well, didn't God create two realms? And he created all things. And God, Paul, Paul wants all men to see the fellowship of the mystery which hath been hidden. God who created all things by Christ Jesus to the intent that now under the principalities and powers where? In the heavenly places might be known by who? The manifold wisdom of God according to what? The eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. You are not just to sit down here and talk about mystery, 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 mystery. Most of them don't even know what the mystery is. God wants us to understand and to see the fellowship of the mystery to everything else God has eternally purposed in the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants you to understand your calling in His eternal purpose. You got it? I hope you do. Because it's important. Right? Look at Romans 16. Come back to Romans 16. I want you to see the depths of this, man. I'm not mad, man. I'm really not. I just get fiery, guys. Just deal with me, okay? I try to tell myself I'm going to come over here and be sweet. It's just not in me. Y'all wouldn't take me serious if I got up here and was like, Dearly beloved, what a blessed day we're having. Y'all wouldn't take me serious anyway. Would you? I hope you wouldn't. That's car salesman talk, man. That's, that's somebody peddling trash on you usually. Amen? <laughs> Look at Romans 16, 25. Look what he says. Not just that there was a, something kept secret or something spoken, but now notice what he says. The preaching of Jesus Christ. Right? Now get it. The way God is going to establish you is by the preaching of Jesus Christ. But notice what he says about that preaching. The preaching of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and, and by the scriptures of the prophets. That means... That there's two preachings of Jesus Christ. Now, something had been kept secret. Something had been spoken since the world began. But now up here, you've got the complete word of God. Look at Colossians. Somebody come to Colossians. Y'all don't all have to flip there. Somebody get Colossians 1.25 and read it. I'll show you. Whereof I made a minister. Is that the verse? Whereof I made a minister according to what? Given to who? To fulfill what? So, let's, let's just think logically for a second. Y'all believe this, right? Secret spoken. Paul said he was made a minister of the church according to the dispensation of God given to him to fulfill the word of God. Well what needed to be fulfilled? What was incomplete about God's word? There was something he had been keeping secret since the world began. And the dis now look, look at what he says in verse 26. What was the dispensation given to him? Even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. So God had been keeping a secret. So what did he dispense to Paul? He dispensed to Paul the revelation of this mystery, which had been kept secret since the world began, for the purpose of fulfilling God's word. You have the whole thing now. God has made known unto us the mystery of his will. That in a dispensation of the fullness of times, we've got all the information we need to understand what God is doing in the process of time. But in your New Testament now, after you get on the other side of the book of Acts, 
There's two preachings of Jesus Christ in your New Testament epistles. Romans through Philemon is Paul writing the epistles that preach Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that had been kept secret since the world began. Hebrews to Revelation is preaching Jesus Christ by the scriptures of the prophets. You understand that? That's, that's, that's crucial for you moving forward. Now you know when a preacher in the time you live in wants to run here every Sunday so that he can get you down at the altar doubting your salvation, you know he's out of the program. Amen. Amen. And you know that's why no matter what you do, you can't get rid of the doubts. Because you're looking for your assurance here, not there. Let me ask you if there's a difference. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, right? Paul said that God, having forgiven you all trespasses. You tell me if there's a difference and which one are you looking for to give you assurance? Amen. Are y'all with me? Is there a difference in confessing your sins to be forgiven and God having already forgiven you all trespasses? Now some of you don't want to deal with it. That's fine. I believe the words on that page and I believe they're pure. And I believe you in Christ have already been forgiven all trespasses. Go to Colossians 1. We'll see if I'm lying. Go to Colossians 2. It's Colossians 2. Somebody begin in verse 10. Keep going. Keep going. And you being dead in your sins and your uncircumcision of the flesh, has he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses? All right, all right. Y'all believe it? Y'all believe you're in him up here? Amen. Let me ask you if there's a difference in this one. We are made partakers with Christ if, if, we hold the confidence, the beginning of our confidence, steadfast unto the end. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. Is there a difference? Yes, sir. Don't get mad at me then. Take it up with the book. I've studied. I know how to rightly divide that book. Don't get mad at me. Take it up with the book. I just read your passages. Amen? Is there a difference in being seated in heavenly places and looking for the Lord to return to the earth? Is there a difference in being called up to meet the Lord in the air and His feet standing upon the Mount of Olives? Is there a difference between we look for our Savior from heaven to why stand ye gazing into heaven? Is there a difference in being told to look into heaven and being rebuked for standing there gazing into heaven. There are two programs. You ought to be looking into heaven because he's coming to call you up. This program, they're not to look up until they see all these things. Then lift up your head and look up for your redemption draweth nigh. Don't get mad at me, man. I didn't even plan on getting into all this stuff. What I want you to understand is that there's two preachings of Christ in that New Testament. 
Hebrews through Revelation is preaching him in accordance to the scriptures of the prophets which had spoken since the world began. Paul was preaching the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that had been kept secret since the world began. But what's it all about? Well, what it's all about, uh, where do I go from here? Look at Colossians chapter 1. Let's, let's go there. Y'all were close to Colossians anyway, I think. Colossians chapter 1. What it's all about is God created these two places here. And these two places, whether you know it or not, that place right there is full. The earth is full of thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. That's easy for you to see. That one's visible. But up here in the heavenly places are thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers that are invisible. Yeah. Right? Look at Colossians 1.16. For, for by him were all things created that are in, in the earth. Whether they be, or he says, both visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. That means... Both these realms that God created in the beginning have visible and, invis visible and invisible thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. Now the mystery of God's will. When you read Ephesians, when Paul, if you don't understand this, guys, what comes first, Colossians 1 or Colossians 3? Okay. So when Paul tells you, if you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God, what things is he telling you to seek? He's telling you to seek out these thrones, dominions, and principalities in the heavenly places. That's your calling. And you need to be down here understanding the will of the Lord, learning the knowledge of your Father because he's called you to something in the heavenly places. Amen. And we are not to set our affections on the things of the earth. Because you're dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. Amen. Amen. So if I'm not to set my affections on things down here, where am I to set them? And so what this thing is all about when Paul writes Ephesians and he says, God has made known unto us the mystery of his will, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both, both, both means two. That means there's two, not only is there two preachings of Christ, there's two gatherings in the Christ. There's a gathering of all things in earth in Christ. There's a gathering of all things in heaven in Christ. So the next time somebody tries to argue with you, Paul said there were people in Christ before him. Yeah, okay. Listen, everything. Do you understand two realms? And if God is gathering all things in heaven and earth in Christ to gather both into one in the dispensation of the fullness of times, that tells me something about what God's doing in time. Before he can gather both in one, he's got to gather them into Christ first. That tells me something about what he's doing today. And when I believed the gospel, guess what God did? He sealed me in Christ. I've been gathered into him. For a future purpose. Amen. But when you talk about the gathering of all things, what is all things in heaven and earth? Thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. Amen? When Christ went back up here, I understand this. When Christ went back to the Father. Now we know, we know He's going to remain in heaven until these times out here. Those times deal with the earth. That's why he's coming back to the earth. Remember we asked, what is God doing between these two advents? Well, when he set Christ up here, he made him the head of all things to the church, which is his 
body. Well, what's his body? The fullness of him. You know what you are? You're the fullness of Christ. You all got a measure in Christ. And that entire measure, Bill's measure, my measure, your measure, all of us collectively together make up His fullness. And it's His fullness that is going to fill all things one day. That means God has called you to become a measure of His Son that His Son may use you to fill all things in heaven. You know, Paul said when he ascended up on high, he said, He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. That's why Christ went back to heaven, is to fill all things in heaven and earth. Christ has a responsibility now. Do you know who he is? He's God's son, the heir of all things, the heir of heaven and earth. And he has a responsibility now up here as God's son and heir of heaven and earth. His responsibility now is to fill all the thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers in heaven and earth for the purpose of reconciling heaven and earth back to his father. Amen. That's what he's doing. And he ain't got time for your, your nonsense. Yes, sir. You're either going to get on board and learn about it, man, or you're not. But he ain't worried about your bills. He ain't worried about the vanity of this world. The world to come is what's subject to the Lord Jesus Christ. God gave him a name that is above every name, not only in this life, but that which is to come also. People are so wrapped up at the present time. They don't understand that when they heard the gospel, man, you were called out of the vanity of this world and placed into the great hope of the eternal purpose of God in Jesus Christ. You've been made an heir of God and a joint heir with His Son for eternity. It's already been paid for, man. What is this all about? Well, come to Ezekiel, man. We're going to have to finish this next week. But I want to, I don't want to make a liar out of Stephen. So two more verses, Stephen. <laughs> two more verses. That means 14 more. Ezekiel 28. I've kind of jumped ahead into in what I was going to be talking about. As long as, long as you understand something was kept secret, something was spoken, now, now that the mystery's been revealed, we have in the New Testament the preaching of Christ according to the revelation of this mystery and the preaching of Christ according to the scriptures of the prophets. You should understand by now that the mystery deals with the heavenly places that's why it's being fulfilled right now while Christ is in heaven. Guess where you're seated at right now? Amen. In heavenly places in Him. This out here deals with when this is complete, God is going to resume and bring the times of restitution to the earth. Now, you say, but what is this all about? Well, look at Ezekiel 28. Look at verse 2. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, thou hast said, I am God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a what? You know what that man is there? He's a prince. Now remember what we're talking about, man. Don't, don't leave me. Remember what we're talking about, thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers in both realms. And who is God talking to in Ezekiel 28? He's talking to a prince of this earth. And what does he say about him? He says, your heart is lifted up with pride. Where did that pride come from? 
You know what that man says in his heart? I'm God. Where did he learn to think like that? You know what God says about him? He says, thou art a man and not a God. Now, now, now get Psalm 82. No, don't go there. I get sidetracked. Look at, now come over to verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. See that? Say unto him, thus saith the Lord God, thou sellest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Look at what he says about him in verse 14. Thou art the anointed what? So you're dealing with a man and a cherub. Right? God's addressing a prince on this earth that he says is a man. That man's lifted up with pride. But then he starts addressing a king that he calls the anointed cherub. Now guys, I know what a cherub is. It ain't a man. Right? Now what you have to understand is God is addressing a kingdom here called Tyrus. And when he addresses that kingdom, he addresses a man who is a prince sitting on a throne on the earth and he also addresses a cherub that you can't see that is obviously in the heavenly places. That cherub is the source of that pride right there. Remember what Paul said? That a man of God cannot be, a, that a bishop cannot be a novice, lest being lifted up with what? Pride, he fall into condemnation of who? Now look, 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 at what, look at what Ezekiel, verse 15, look at what he says about him. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created, Till what was found in him. Do you understand the mystery of iniquity now? What's that earthly prince saying? I am what? God. Y'all ever read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? The man of sin. Who's going to sit in the temple of God. Showing himself that he is God. And Paul says, now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time for the mystery of what? Iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let till he be taken out of the way and then shall that wicked be revealed. Whose coming is after the working of who? Satan. There is iniquity in the heart of this cherub right here. That iniquity is working in the world you're in. And one of these days, there's a man coming to this earth who's going to sit in God's seat. He's going to walk into the temple and plop his rear end down on God's throne and say, I am God. And you know where he learned to think like that? From that bum right there. I hope you get it. That iniquity is working, guys. That's the course your world is on. Your course, look at Isaiah 14. Isaiah chapter 14. I'll show you the world you live in. You go out here and enjoy it if you want. Isaiah chapter 14. The older I get in this thing, man, the less I, less I want anything to do with this world when I step outside these doors, man. Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from? So where was he at? Heaven. O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Now remember, iniquity was found in him. Here it is. Here's the iniquity. Now God is addressing in Isaiah 14 the king of Babylon. There's a man aspect to it there's a spiritual aspect to Babylon. Now get this. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. That's God's seat. 
God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So there's a being up here in heaven who, who ascended into heaven, exalted his throne above the stars of God, sits also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north to ascend above the heights of the clouds. You know what that is? That's a being trying to take possession of heaven and earth away from the creator, the most high God. Do you know what you, now listen man, do you know who sets the course of this world? This iniquity of this being, when he exalted his throne above the stars of God, that's one of the thrones. There's a throne up here that's exalted above the stars of God. And his iniquity now infects the thrones, dominions, principalities and powers of both heaven and earth. That iniquity is at work in the creation. Amen. And you live in a world that has conspired and is on course to usurp heaven and earth from the creator of it. And how dare you participate? You with me? I hope you are, man. They'll teach Islam in university, won't they? They'll teach Confucius and the sutras, and they'll talk about they'll talk about Descartes, Nietzsche. Aristotle and Socrates. They won't talk about Solomon. No. They won't talk, they'll talk about Mozart, Beethoven, the greatest songwriter this world's ever known was David the King. They won't talk about his music or his songs. This world hates God. This world hates the things that are holy and belong to Him because there is a being dead set on being like the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Amen. Amen. That's the iniquity that now courses through the governments and the principalities of this world. You know what they're seeking to do? They're seeking to bring all things under satanic dominion. This world out here in the tribulation, you know what it is? God gives the world over to satanic tyranny. That's what he does. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth, for Satan has come down unto you having great wrath. He gives the world over to satanic tyranny. <laughs> Boy, I'm glad to be in Christ, man. The redeemer and reconciler of all things, Bill. I'm glad to be in him. Paul talks about the course of this world, that it's according to the prince of the power of who? The air. The spirit that now worketh where? In the children of disobedience. That spirit of iniquity is now working in the children of disobedience in this world. Whether they understand it, want to participate or not, it's working in them. The only way to be freed from the iniquity of, this, of the course of this world is to be in Christ and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. When Paul tells you to quit walking like other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, he tells you to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on this new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Amen. That man right there is the reconciler of heaven and earth, the subduer of all things back to the Father. I hope you understand this was the necessity of the cross. By his blood he made peace. By him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things in heaven or things in the earth. God has a wonderful time prepared in the future. But you've got to understand what the necessity of this is all about. What God planned to do. In the earth was not kept secret, guys. Peter said the restitution of all things, talking about the return of Christ to the earth, the heaven must receive him, 
until his return to the earth, which begins the times of restitution, spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. God didn't keep secret his plan for the earth. As soon as Satan showed up in the garden, you know what Satan's doing there? Satan, this spiritual iniquity, usurp the dominion of the earth. The only way Satan can bring the earth under his dominion is through man. God gave the earth to man. So if Satan wants to cease possession of the earth, he has to corrupt man. That's the purpose of a net sin and death. He brings man under his dominion. Man's no longer subject to the authority of God's Spirit. The Spirit of that bum there now works in the children of disobedience. But as soon as it happens, God tells him, I'm going to bring a seed out of the woman. I'm going to bring a man to this earth that's going to bruise your whole system. It's going to bruise your seed, his head. God promises a Redeemer who would subdue the earthly dominion back to God. That's what Israel's doing when they're going in to make warfare in the book of Joshua. They're retaking possession of the earth for the Most High God because it's been usurped. The people living in God's land were sacrificing the devils and the, these, these spiritual beings up here. They weren't sacrificing to God. They didn't even acknowledge the Most High God. Read these verses when you get home. Psalm 2, Psalm chapter 8, Psalm 132, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7 says the government is upon his shoulders to establish it and to order it. When Christ, when God gives Christ the authority of the earth, all the government of the earth is going to be upon his shoulders and Christ is going to establish that government and order that government. And the increase of that government, there shall be no end. God has always spoken about these times of restitution out here. You know what he promised David in Psalm 132? Of the fruit of thy body will I sit upon thy throne. Remember this? The Spirit of God is going to occupy the throne of David through a man. When Jesus Christ sits in that seat and says, I am God and I sit in the seat of God, it's because he's speaking truth. You see, you see what I'm talking about? Prince of Tyrus, I sit in the seat of God, I am God. That cherub is behind that. That's iniquity. When Jesus Christ sits on the throne of David and says, I sit in the seat of God and I am God, he's speaking the truth. Amen. Because God promised David, of the fruit of thy body will I sit upon thy throne. God is going to sit upon the throne of David through a man. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of heaven on the earth is a physical kingdom. And that physical kingdom of heaven, here's what God is going to do. This earth is going to be subdued under the authority of the spiritual kingdom of God operating through the physical throne of David. Through David's seed, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that kingdom, when it's established in the nation of Israel, that kingdom is the prince of God. Not the prince of that cherub up there. Israel is the prince of God. That's what the name means. And when that nation is established in the earth, that kingdom is going to subdue all things in the earth back to the Father. You say, what's that got to do with the mystery? Not a thing. Yet. We'll get to that next week. What I want you to know right now is that what God has planned for the earth has been spoken. The question is, is what is God going to do about this iniquity in heaven? What is God going to do when Satan and those seven heads and those ten horns and that third of the stars are cast down to the earth and their place is not found in heaven anymore? Who's going to take up all that power and authority? Who's going to fill those vacated 
thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. This is what Satan didn't know. He knew God's plan for the earth. He didn't know that that man was going to raise from the dead and become the head of a new creature that God was going to create in the heavenly places. Now this is what we're going to pick up with next week. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery which God ordained before the world unto our glory. You have been ordained by God to glory out here in the future. And he ordained it before the world. And he kept it secret since the world began. And had Satan and his, those principalities and princes of this world, had they known the glory that God had ordained for us in the heavenly realm, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. You were given a purpose in Christ before the world began. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Amen. Agree with me, preacher. That's phenomenal that God gave me a purpose in His Son before the world began. And you know how long that purpose is? It's His eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ. God gave you an eternal purpose in His Son before you were born. Now don't you want to learn about it? Don't you want to understand it? Paul said, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Or what are you called with? What's your vocation? God don't need, he's already got Israel. He's going to do in the earth what he always planned to do through the nation of Israel. We are something brand new, Bill. We are Christ's fullness in heaven. How's Christ going to fill all things in heaven? Us. You're going up there as heirs of God. One of these days, man, one of these days Christ is going to call us up and as the head, as the head, as the one responsible for filling all these things in heaven, we're all going to appear before him at the judgment seat. Every one of us. And he's going to, he's going to judge us. He's going to reveal what we've built up on that foundation. He's going to reveal our doctrinal edification, our wisdom, our understanding, our knowledge. He's going to reveal all that. And then whatever's left of you is going to receive the reward of the inheritance. If any man's work abide, he shall receive a reward. Your reward of the inheritance up there is going to be according to your doctrinal edification. That's why God gave you a book. He didn't tell you a bunch of stuff to do. He gave you a book. And that book was given to you to, to perfect you unto every good work to furnish you unto every good work because God's ordained good works for us before the foundation of the world. And God is going to, when Christ, after Christ judges us and, and reveals that edification in us, He's going to take us back to the Father and present us there as God's sons and heirs and say, this, this is how furnished this man is. God's going to say, put him there. This and that, there, there. And Christ is going to begin to fill all things in heaven. And we get to participate in the heavenly business of the Father, reconciling all those things back to Him Amen. for eternity. Glory be to God. Amen. Now that's the basis of right division. We'll talk more about the mystery next week. Any questions on this before we close? I think we covered it pretty well, don't you? God's got two realms. He's reconciling them both back to him, and he kept part of it secret, and part of it he spoke. And to understand your calling as a Gentile into this thing, you had no, you were aliens to God's plan down here. It's only in this plan up here in Christ that us Gentiles have been given a part and made joint heirs and of the same body. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the many blessings of life. God, we, I just pray, Lord, that you would open all of our eyes to understand these things better, Lord, to understand the hope of your calling and the, the riches of the glory of the inheritance that's in the saints and the dominion. Father, help us to understand our position in him, our measure in him, the fullness of him. And our, our, our measure and our participation as members in this body 
and how, how we are to grow up into him in all things that we can all be fitly brought together and joined together as, as that one body and one spirit and one faith, all united in, in faith and knowledge of your son, God, that we can operate and function as, as the body of Christ. Lord, I just pray that you would help us to understand the world we live in, what its plot is, what its course is, that there's spiritual iniquity at work, Father, that's conspired against you, that's rebelled against you, that, that, that seeks to rid you out of your own creation and, and subject the world to their own authority. And Lord, we, we just thank you for the great plan of redemption and reconciliation that you purpose for us in Christ. And Lord, we just pray that you would give us long suffering as we endure this present time of suffering and vanity, the bondage of corruption, Lord, but help us to understand what you're doing at this present time, that we can labor with you and redeem the time for, for your will and purpose. And God, we just ask all these things in the lovely and precious name of our great Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.